enjoyed the month or two that I've been there, uh, with the exception of having to look at that and having to wonder, well, I'm gone, what's going on there, and having to lock my door now more so than before, um, look out my windows more, uh, check on my cars more, uh, worry about my family when I'm not there. Um, been some great neighbors that I met, and uh, I'm sure you've heard from some of them. But the whole, the whole point is I, I keep hearing on public forums about how we want to help both situations, um, you know, end this in like a, you know, civil manner or whatnot. Well, I'm, I'm about up to here with it. Um, it's unacceptable as far as I'm concerned. I don't think that's the type of town that you guys are trying to, you know, portray. But the first thing when you drive into town and you turn on that first road into town, that's what you see. Uh, and then when it sits there for, um, we're going on probably almost the whole time I've been there now. And it's gone from one to two to now it's six, seven, you know, certain days it's higher than that. Um, call code enforcement, it doesn't seem to have any effect. I haven't seen any tires get marked. I haven't seen any cars get towed. Um, that kind of stuff is just, you know, if you guys want to help the problem, I don't see you by allowing them to stay there. If we have a city ordinance that you can only park for 72 hours in a certain spot, and then you need to move at least 350 feet away, and I believe it was not on the same block. Um, that's not being enforced. And if that's the case, um, you know, they've been there way longer than that. And I don't see any services up there that would help them. You know, I talked to Express. They have 80-plus jobs that they can't fill. Uh, talk to people at Goodwill. They'll write a resume for people. If people need to get jobs, um, just for the record, my wife and I started in McMinnville five years ago. Neither one of us had a job when we came here. <clears throat> we both went through temp agencies. We got hired on. We purchased one house, sold it. We moved into another house. We want to stay here, but we keep seeing stuff like this go on. Um, I don't feel like it's getting addressed. Um, so that's why I'm here. Thank you, Sean. We next have Caroline O'Brien. Caroline, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for taking time to listen. I, uh, I understand that resources are really on a shoestring. Uh, oh, my name is Caroline O'Brien. I live at 1591 Southwest Wright Street. It's at the intersection of Wright and AG, which is kind of a main drive. It leads straight to the grade school and then back up to 2nd Street. But we are having an enormous problem with speeding there. It, I mean, there are sometimes it's not even the sound of traffic. It's just a quick buzz because they're moving so fast. And in the summer, it's kind of scary because you I, I can hear kids racing their cars. I understand we're really, really tight on resources, but if you have meetings with your planning department, consider maybe putting in speed bumps on AG because it's, uh, I mean, there are kids riding their bikes back and forth to school, and I'm really, really concerned about a safety issue there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, next, we have Nick Robinson. Good evening. My name's Nick Robinson. Thank you. Um, a couple weeks ago, I was here speaking about the door and drive situation. I've uh, been doing a lot, trying to be proactive, trying to find solutions. Um, but I'm just running into a roadblock. Um, one of the big things is code enforcement. Um, I've had some discussions with Pam Ramsey. Um, we've called in after business hours and talked to police officers. And basically, they're saying that the ordinances are too vague to enforce. One of our big concerns is uh, the dogs running loose. Um, I've looked up the city boundaries and the field next to Doran Drive is within the city limits. So code 6.04.150 specifically says it's a violation to own or keep a dog and allow point A, the dog to run at large. Seems pretty direct to me when we've called it in. The police officers say it's too vague or it only applies to a residential area and they can't enforce it. Um, another issue I had was 
There is an Oregon State revised statute that says you can't park within 10 feet of a hydrant. We had a um, kind of a car hauler type trailer parked less than 10 feet of a hydrant. It was parked right on the edge of the yellow paint. I addressed that with Pam and her direct response was to me, standing there looking at it person to person. She told me that she doesn't enforce the code, she enforces the paint. I thought her job as a code enforcement officer was to enforce the code, but apparently that's not so. So it seems, you know, seems that the police department and PAM the code enforcement officers are scared to enforce this because of um, these people have sued the city and before it sounds like from kind of what we've heard. But at what point do we need to sue the city because they're not acting? And is it going to take one of our children or us personally getting attacked by one of these loose dogs <coughs> before something's done? Or can we be proactive about this? Um, I don't know if Chief Scales has anything to add to that. Uh, Chief will we'll address it at the end of our, our comments tonight. Okay. So that's all I have for now. Thank you, Nick. Thank you for having me. Uh -huh. Is it Maya Lovett? <clears throat> Welcome. So I live at 3157 Hidden Meadow Drive, and I have a couple issues with the transient camp that's been set up by our neighborhood. Could you move the mic a little closer to you, Maya? Sure. Thank you. First off, I would like to know if we can get, you know, um, kind of um, find out if they're on the sexual predator registry or something like that, because since they've been there for a really long time and they're trying to be our neighbors, we should at least be able to know if, you know, they're a sex offender. And... I don't like them open carrying, and I feel that we should know if they're a felon or not, if they're going to be able to patrol their new area with a gun on their hip. Um, one of them also goes way down into the field behind my house with his gun and his pit bull, and I, I just don't feel comfortable with them circling my, my house with the gun, and the pit bull attacked my neighbor's fence because they had a cat on the other side, and so that's a mess. Um, there is a statute that the legislature of Oregon ratified during the 2016 assembly, and that's 197.005, and that one does address his motorhomes in the state, and I would very much like for the state um, statutes to be followed in lack of you guys having your own personal statutes, and can you guys possibly just cut and paste Newberg's RV statues and apply them to Menville. It really shouldn't have to take months upon months upon months. It should be really easy. I mean, Forest Grove has a statue about it that protects people and neighborhoods and property values. And let's see here. <clears throat> We used to see the police patrolling our neighborhood, too, and they kind of stopped now that those guys are there. And we have had smells emanating from our, our drain water pipes. They tend to be right before a heavy rain, so we do think that one person has been illegally dumping sewage into the stormwater. And let's see here. And if we don't address this now, with Beaverton and other cities around Portland possibly um, enforcing policies about not allowing people to park on city property at all, those RVs are reaching out into the further areas and they're looking for places to camp. There's news articles where people are saying they're going from St. Helens to Gresham looking for a spot. And if they're driving out towards St. Helens looking for a place to live, they'll definitely find us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Cheryl Cara. Welcome. 
Thank you. I'm Cheryl. I, I live on Hidden Meadow Drive as well. Uh, if you could bring the mic just a little closer to you. Speak Is that right better? into it. Yeah. Um, so again, the same issue. I moved into that neighborhood a couple years ago and it was a really nice place to be. Um, we paid a fair price for our home and our idea was to have a good safe place for, to raise our, our now one-year-old. And I never saw anybody in our neighborhood that didn't live there. Um, it was clean and it was beautiful and it was great. And now we have this camp on Doran Drive. And I know one of my neighbors sold his house for much less than he thought it was worth because potential buyers were complaining about this issue. And now I do see a lot of people wandering through our neighborhood that I haven't seen before. I see stray dogs defecating on lawns that probably don't have their shots. Um, little dogs, big dogs. I see people just generally walking through and I don't feel like it's a nice, clean, safe neighborhood like it used to be. And I, I don't have any problem with the people in general that are camped. I just feel like the news article on Friday quoting some of these people, they called us entitled and said we don't have anything to worry about. And I took issue with that because my husband and I worked very hard and made a lot of sacrifices to purchase a home in that neighborhood. And we work opposite schedules because we can't afford childcare. And now if I try to sell my home, I'm not going to get a fair price for it because people don't want to move into a neighborhood that looks like this. So I'm urging you to possibly pass some sort of law that states people cannot camp overnight on these city streets because I think what's gonna happen is families and people are going to start moving out of the area because McMinnville's going to start to be known for this area where you can just do that type of thing and it's not going to be this you know, cute, wonderful town anymore. It's going to be kind of known for these um, campers and I think that's a shame. I think that will affect the local businesses. And I think that McMinnville will kind of go downhill and people won't want to move here and live here anymore. Um, so I, I feel like that's, that's a shame. And again, you know, everybody needs to have a place to be, but I, I do think it's unacceptable for someone living in an RV to camp, which seems like it's a permanent thing now. Nothing's been done, so more and more people are coming in, and I don't see an end to this. I feel like our neighborhood's getting dumpier and dumpier by the week. So I'm concerned because nothing, nothing's been done. So um, really, it's a shame. I just, my husband and I can't really afford to take a loss on our home, and we want to feel like we're in a safe, clean neighborhood again for our kids, and we just don't feel that way now for a lot of reasons. Thank you, Cheryl, for your thoughtful comments. Thank you. Uh, Griffin Zolver. Welcome. Good evening. Thank you. Um, Griffin Zolner. Uh, I too live off of Hidden Meadow and uh, here for the same reasons. Um, I think it's made pretty evident that uh, the people that we have uh, established off of Duran Drive have found uh, more or less a loophole in um, and taking advantage of something that's an ordinance that, that has some abilities to be able to stretch in terms of our, our enforcement. Um, you know, when I look at this and I, I think of the perspective of those that are choosing this type of lifestyle, I, I, I understand that, I get it. Um, and thousands upon thousands of people do live in this lifestyle where they live in an RV. Um, but I think of those that do it and do it responsibly, they live in RV parks. Um, we have those available and I would think that is a viable option. I understand there's a cost associated with it, but also there's cost of purchasing homes, there's cost of living, there's cost of paying property taxes. That is the route that I think it needs to go um, and, and something that I, I would hope is a viable option and how it should be. Um, you know, my fear when I moved here and I've been in town for three years uh, was looking at the proximity to the Portland metro area, the, the problems that they have faced over uh, a number of years and that those issues that have continued to explode with um, the homeless population, but also those that are living in RVs um, and, and creating a home right on a street that people reside in was going to creep into our town. Um, 
it, it has, and that's something that uh, that you know, Portland's 72 times our size, and we're now seeing the issues that that they have and that they're seeing on a regular basis, and. Uh, I, I don't see this as anything that uh, is going to continue to get uh, uh, simpler or easier for us if we let it to continue to perpetuate. And um, it's something that we're going to be facing uh, on a large, a much larger scale as we kind of continue forward. Um, I think that the citizens here have made it very clear in terms of where they're coming from. I think that's evident by the last city council meeting where I think we had five people speak on this. And, you know, I'd love to see a show of hands of those that are here tonight that are here representing that neighborhood and the cause that's in place. As you can see, um, this is going to continue to build and grow. Um, and I, you know, I, I leave with this and I just ask all of you um, as a city council that if you imagine waking up in the morning, you look out your front door, you know, in park there are a handful of RVs, um, people living out of them, vehicles, congregated trailers, piles of belongings. You see this day in and day out. You know, you, you, you have to question whether you want to go walk down a certain part of your neighborhood. You have to question what your property taxes are potentially going for. You have to question your resale value of each of your individual homes. Um, I ask that you look at it that way because each of the people that just raised their hands are looking at it from that same perspective and they're seeing it day in and day out. And in, in looking at it that way, I hope that you carry forward the urgency to resolve on this as quickly as possible because we're seeing it day in and day out. So thank you. Thank you, Griffin. Mark Rich. Welcome, Mark. Thank you for uh, letting the public speak uh, in front of your council. I come here, I've been here before, to address the homeless issue. That I love Cyril's comment. She said that she understands that we all need a place to be. I've been saying that time and time and time again every time I come here. If you would give these people a property, one out of over 200 properties the city of McMinnville owns, I've heard that there's three properties that could house the homeless and this issue of the campers. I believe the campers could be put on the back of a camp, behind a tree line, out of view, not on a public street. I also believe that this has been an ongoing problem that will not be addressed in the proper way, and you've always wanted them to move to, uh, to, move to Portland. The thing is, most of these people, I've heard that there's new people that buy in houses here in the community. They've been here three years, five years. I've been homeless for 30 since 1989. Two parent welfare collapse due to immigration and our, our funds being squandered. <coughs> now, the thing is, is that it's always been injustice. I joined the Navy at 17 years old. At 16, I was fired by planting them trees on McMinnville Third Street because I wasn't old enough. I got four hours in. But the injustice, we are all under attack. The people in the trailers are being attacked by the people on the street. We as Americans are being attacked from every side as far as free speech, Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook. Everyone is being attacked from one way or another. But I come to the council tonight to say make a plan to put these campers and the homeless out of town on one of your many properties. You have properties going out to Meadow Lake Road. You have properties going out 2nd Street. You have properties up 99. And another gentleman there just suggested that waste management will donate property to do something like that. And that's not going to cost you except to give up a piece of trash land. But the thing is, these two problems can come together and be resolved with you, the council, that can make the decisions of our public land by the city of McMinnville make the right plan, make the right spot, and we'll get these people out there. It's not going to cost you nothing, but about 95% of the camp is the cost of the real estate. We can take nickels and dimes from three, four different states that have been here on this homeless issue to advise and listen to our problems and address solutions. They've all been here before. There's money from outside this area. It will not cost you a dime. And if the property must be bought, you know what? I suggest you donate it and do a grant for a write-off in taxes. But when that property shows up, three to five acres, let us build it. Let us house these people. Let us get them off your downtown Third Street. 
So they're not a, in your face. I know that there's problems mental, there's problems drugs, and there's problems alcohol. I've been in here to ban the fortified alcohol on 3rd Street, and again, you did nothing. Now, these are all becoming serious problems and spinning out of control. And all it takes is a piece of property for a place to be. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. That is the end of our public hearing this evening, or public comment. Um, I'd like to just turn to the uh, chief. Uh, uh, two weeks ago, we asked you to come back and give us a, a brief report as to some of the concerns we heard two weeks ago, if you would. Uh, uh, we, we have sent uh, um, Pam and uh, Pam Ramsey, code enforcement, uh, Amy Kepler out there with the parking enforcement, and uh, we continue to uh, monitor it. I will say that I've got... Uh, some information back. I know one of the concerns out at Doran Drive was referenced the tractor trailers to the semis. And uh, we and Pam and I and uh, the, cap the captain of the division uh, did talk about that. And we do not have anything permitted uh, We that, that has come to us to be permitted. Uh, so with that being said, the ordinance is pretty specific in that uh, a, a semi truck uh, is only required to be permitted when it's uh, adjacent to a residence. So the area where they were parking in front of, of Dorn uh, is uh, obviously business, industrial, commercial type area. So uh, that those parks or the parking there was was within uh, the the, uh, the semi trucks rights. There was no need to permit it. So I did want to touch base on that. Um, I will again reiterate the the conversations that our team is having with uh, uh, the legal team. Uh, they met again today to discuss specifically uh, the parking uh, ordinance. And candidly, I will agree this. There is, uh, as Griffin said, there are loopholes within this uh, ordinance. And, uh, you know, it, it will take. And, I, and although uh, I say that there's, or it's been referenced that it's a 72 hours and then you're towed, it's actually 72 hours, your vehicle is tagged. It's 72 hours again, your vehicle is, uh, the owner has issued a citation. And then it's another additional 72 hours before the vehicle can be towed. So we're talking upwards of nine days. And any time that vehicle moves, the clock starts over. So we are in a uh, loophole. Uh, and uh, I, I certainly would encourage as we move forward as a council and as we hear from our residents, maybe being able to shore up that uh, ordinance if the council so chooses. I think uh, the, the legal team in, at City Hall has a good understanding of the issues that uh, our code enforcement is dealing with. But uh, certainly, um, uh, that is, it's not going unnoticed, and I know there's frustration. Uh, it's, there's frustration from Portland to Salem, uh, to Seattle, or all over the place, and this is not an issue that's going away. I know the council's well-versed. They've dumped, or not, excuse me, dumped. They provided a lot of resources and money into this, uh, this issue with homeless, uh, the homeless population, uh, and I know that we will continue to address it. It's, it's a very complex uh, multifaceted problem uh, that we're dealing with. We're trying to find some creative solutions through uh, some subcommittee work that uh, the planning directors got, and we will continue to do that. We'll look at options and we'll look at solutions that we can uh, offer up to those that are in the RV and those that, uh, and hopefully provide some relief to those that are in the residential areas. So, thank you, Chief. Uh, Council President? He, there was one gentleman up here that mentioned that, uh, or maybe it was a lady, that Forest Grove and uh, Newburgh had some differences in their ordinances. Is this the case, or are they under the I, I have not looked at those specific. I do know we've looked uh, at a number of, our code enforcement team has looked at a number of different codes There's uh, that are uh, more restrictive and, and easier to enforce in a, in a much more timely manner. Okay, well, that's good to know. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions from... Uh, Councilors to the chief on this issue. Hearing none. Thank you, chief. Uh, we are to that point in our agenda this evening that we have one public hearing, and this is a legislative a public hearing that is being initiated by a city staff and recommended by the McMinnville Planning Commission. The hearing will be digitally recorded and will be held in accordance with the land use uh, process required by the McMinnville Code, the McMinnville Comprehensive Plan, and the State of Oregon. All testimony in these hearings must be directed 
towards the criteria listed on the staff report or other criteria in the comprehensive plan or other land use regulations that the person testifying believes applies to the decision. These are the criteria the city council must use in making its um, uh, decisions. The failure to raise an issue accompanied by statements or evidence sufficient to afford the city council and the parties an opportunity to respond to the issue precludes appeal to the land uh, use board of appeals based on that issue. In order to proceed for tonight's hearing, to be set out in detail on the board. In brief, we will start with a staff report. Next, anyone who supports the application will be given an opportunity to speak after city staff is finished. Next, the opponents may speak. Staff is given then time to respond to any evidence uh, presented. At this point, uh, anyone who has participated in the hearing may request that the uh, city council continues the hearing to a future date or hold the record open for a future date for the purpose of presenting additional testimony. Um, so I think, um, uh, Heather, is it, would you like to give the staff report now or do, uh, do I need to continue and, yes. Uh, I need to continue. the advice of your legal counsel. The, the applicant uh, may waive its rights if he or she wants to. If the city council in the course of its deliberations decides it's, it needs more information, the hearing or the record may be reopened. Once the city council has allowed all the... Um, uh, all of the uh, procedural rights to the parties and once the city council is satisfied that it has all the evidence it needs, it will then close a public hearing, deliberate among themselves and announce the decision. The decision of the city council can be appealed to the land uh, use board of appeals. We wish to hear from everyone who is interested in the proposals. However, we request that you refrain from repeating testimony already given by someone else. If you should testify this evening, please print your name and address clearly on the sheet that's found on the table. Failure to legibly provide this information will excuse, uh, exclude you from notification of any further action on the applications because we, need, we have no way of being able to get in contact with you. <laughs> Tonight's public hearing is docket number G. 4-7 wireless facilities. This is a legislative action initiated by a city staff to amend the McMinnville City Code section 17.06 and 17.55 relative to wireless facilities. I will now open the hearing. And uh, um, does anyone wish to object to the jurisdiction of the city council to hear this matter? Seeing none, does any councilor wish to make any disclosures or abstain from participating in voting on this uh, application? <clears throat> Seeing none, does any councilor need to declare any prior uh, contact prior to this hearing with the applicant? and any other party involved in this hearing or any other source of information outside of staff regarding the subject of this hearing? Seeing none, uh, will the st staff please give a brief uh, description of the application? Heather? Yes, so uh, good evening, Mayor and City Councilors. This is a legislative um, land use application coming to you. It's being initiated by the city to amend the McMinnville City Code uh, relative to wireless facilities. It is something that you also have in your uh, council agenda as ordinance number 5043. So the situation we're facing is that the city's first wireless communication facilities chapter of the zoning ordinance was adopted in June of 2000 and it hasn't been changed since then. <coughs> So over the last 17 years, as you know, wireless communications, the industry has has changed very quickly, has evolved significantly, and our code hasn't kept up with those changes. We also, at the federal level, the FCC has adopted multiple amendments governing the wireless industry that we need to comply with as a local jurisdiction. Uh, some of those amendments are that uh, wireless facilities are exempt from most regular, that the regulations exempt uh, personal wireless devices, such as cell phones, iPads, et cetera, TV dishes, 
And then it also exempts re uh, requiring local agencies to administratively approve minor amendments to existing facilities. Uh, now is the time to change the code because there was a recent update again by the FCC. There's a lot of communities going through this process. Um, and since our code was so outdated, it was something that went into the Planning Commission work plan for 2017. What the current code does is um, it provides a pretty good foundation for establishing McMinnville's first wireless facility code. Uh, the regulations have allowed wireless towers in the industrial zones without height limits. Uh, the current regulations also allow up to 20 additional feet of height to be added by antennas to those existing structures that are in all the zones. Uh, we require landscaping at the antenna base and uh, at the equipment enclosure. So a lot of people think of the cell towers specifically when they're thinking of wireless facilities, but there's a lot of cabinets and equipment that support those that are on the ground as well. Um, so in 2000, when this was put together, it was pretty progressive to think about screening that equipment and the current code provides that. And then in the downtown area, um, we also, if there is the interest in putting antennas on existing structures, we ask for it to go through a conditional use approval process so that we can notify neighboring uh, properties about that intent. So currently around McMinnville, there are the examples that we have are wireless communications towers. Uh, many of them are fairly large. Um, we have one at 152 feet on Lafayette Avenue in the industrial zone, one at Highway 18 at 136 feet, and one at Alpine for at 157 street, 157 feet. There's actually several there by Alpine Avenue. And then a variety of other ones that are on some of the commercial <coughs> corridors, as well as the one that's at the fire department at 153 feet. Uh, to put that in perspective, our maximum building height in many of these zones is 60 feet. We also have what we call alternative support structures. So these are um, other um, types of improvements that are on the ground that an antenna can attach to. Um, for a wireless facility, and we have several of those in the downtown area because we do not allow the, the uh, cell towers there, and several of these are located in, at the Gallery Theater as well as 3rd and Ford. And usually these are the types of facilities that people don't see as much in terms of the visibility in their landscape. The intent of the amendments that are in front, in front of you today is to allow for the flexibility of an evolving technology. So this will continue to evolve. It will continue to become more important to us. Um, and it's becoming more and more prolific. We're not, we're not using less data. We're using more data. But uh, it's also starting to become more prolific in terms of how it's impacting the built environment. So there's a lot of communities looking at aesthetic standards so that the technology is not only a functional asset, but is also a built environment asset. <coughs> So the amendments in front of you tonight are looking at things such as stealth, so how to design these facilities so that they're compatible with the neighborhoods in which they're being installed. Um, Co-location, so how to use the existing facilities as much as possible and leverage that already built environment that exists. To look at minimizing the height in the residential zones and in special areas such as the downtown. And then to allow for small cell technology as that is an evolving um, industry product. What we want to avoid that's starting to occur in many communities is in reaction to some of these cell towers and where they're being placed and the fact that they aren't compatible with the neighborhood in which they're going. There's been um, lots of petitions against them. There's been uh, land use cases that are going through the court system appealing them. So we, we want to make sure that we're avoiding that type of circumstance here in McMinnville. The process to get here, we identified this as a goal of our 2017 Planning Commission work plan. Um, we started by reviewing and evaluating other communities' codes throughout the state of Oregon. And then we developed a draft and worked with legal counsel uh, for compliance with the FCC. So prior to taking it through a public process, we wanted to make sure it was legally compliant with the federal regulations as well as the state regulations. And then we went through several planning work sessions with the Planning Commission. Um, through the work sessions, we had someone come forward uh, who lives here in McMinnville and works with Crown Castle, which is a company that serves uh, these types of uh, technology vendors and offered to help us put some <coughs> of the code together. Uh, so we spent about two months working with um, uh, that volunteer to sort of refine the language that we had already drafted. We then uh, 
The Planning Commission then voted on that final draft on November 16th as a recommendation to the City Council. It came to you as the City Council on November 28th. At that time, staff recommended that we put it into a public hearing process because we had just been approached by Verizon who wasn't aware that we were going through these draft amendments and they wanted some time to be able to review them, provide their comments and work with staff on any refinements that may need to be made so that um, they could provide their industry expertise so that we could continue to achieve that intent of being flexible to um, the evolving technology. And so tonight in front of you, you have a public hearing um, as a final result of that. Our recommendations is actually to delete the existing chapter that's on for wireless communications facilities and adopt a whole new chapter because so much of it has changed. And some of the elements that are in there that we're changing is we're, we are making sure that we're exempting what we need to exempt. So you don't want to regulate things that don't need to be regulated or don't allow for the flexibility in terms of public safety or things like that to be able to be installed in an immediate manner. So cells that are on wheels, such as mobile broadcasting vans are obviously um, exempted. Um, amateur radio stations, ham radio, uh, our SCADA system that we use for our infrastructure program, and then federally exempted modifications to towers. In terms of how these facilities will come into the different zones, uh, antenna support structures are what you typically think of when you think of a cell tower, and the al alternative antenna support structures are what you think of when you think of a cell tower that's been really uniquely positioned in a stealth way in a community or a building where an antenna has been placed. So in the residential zone, the recommendation is those, those cell towers that, that I showed you earlier are not allowed in moving forward in residential zones. And really the encouragement is that antennas um, are permitted, but that they're to go on, on, on these the, on alternative antenna support structures. And I'll show you some pictures of what that means, but typically that's going onto some of the buildings that have the higher peaks in the residential areas or putting up um, stealth um, towers that look like lot, um, trees that, that's been a, um, installed in a lot of communities or something other more unique than that in terms of flagpoles or public art or something of that nature. They do need to go above the um, roof line of the home, so they need to be taller than our uh, maximum height that's in the zone. So we had some discussion with Verizon about that and how to achieve that, but also not get to the point of that picture I showed you earlier, which was about four times higher than the product of the residential homes around it. So we do allow a conditional use um, to bring an antenna onto an alternative support structure uh, that goes through a conditional use process in the residential zone. <clears throat> It's somewhat similar for commercial zones in terms of we're encouraging, again, ant antennas on these alternative ant antenna support structures. In the industrial zone, we're allowing those cell towers because that's where we feel that it makes sense in terms of compatibility for the surrounding properties in the neighborhood. Um, and they're permitted up to 100 feet. If, the, if um, a vendor can come in and show that they need to go higher than 100 feet, because I showed you several of those that we have in the community that are higher than 100 feet, they are allowed to go. Um, over 100 feet. <clears throat> and then in our agricultural, agricultural holding zone, which actually is a county zone of land that we've brought into the city that's meant to develop into some sort of city product in the future, be it residential, commercial, or industrial, we are recommending that it's a conditional use process so that there's the opportunity to review it and make sure that it's compatible with whatever the planned future development for that area is. In the um, code, we also have development review standards. These are some new standards that, um, that we're bringing into the code where we're looking at visual impact of these towers. So we're looking at height, we're looking at how to screen what we need to screen. We're looking at color, signage associated with them. We're looking at how they're attached to historic buildings and structures, what the accessory buildings look like in terms of the where the equipment is, the utility vaults. Um, equipment pedestals, how it impacts parking, so bringing a, a tower onto an existing <clears throat> parking lot, it can't, it can't usurp the minimum parking allowance for that, for that site. Um, it also can't block sidewalks and pathways, and then we're looking at how they're lit. So as they become more and more prolific in the uh, community, we want to make sure that the, we're mitigating impact just like we do for other types of products. 
We're also looking at setbacks and separation. That's in there for um, the proposed amendments. Uh, the setback would be equal to or greater than the height of the tower. So that's that's that tower that's allowed in the industrial areas. Um, and then um, there are no uh, wireless community facilities of any type, including the guide tower anchors are allowed in that required setback. And that's a safety feature that's written into the code. And then we do have language in there that is about co-location and encouraging that as much as possible. We also have set up some uh, application procedures in the code as well. Um, as you remember, we just went through an amendment for neighborhood meetings. Um, that passed through prior to this particular code. So one of the amendments you see in front of you tonight um, that was not part of your November 28th meeting is we're actually deleted all the language we had in there relative to neighborhood meetings and are just um, referencing the code that we put together for that. So that everything, so all neighborhood meetings will go through the same type of process. But the intent there is that the surrounding neighborhood is aware of, aware of the proposed product. Um, we're also um, asking if, if there is the need to put um, these facilities in a residential zone to provide a residential siting analysis. So why do you need it there? Why do you need it that high? Show us the coverage um, that is required for that. Because again, we want to be able to support the technology, but we also want to mitigate the overall impact. And then we're also asking for um, how will these be maintained moving forward? There's also a section in there about owner's responsibility. This is um, this is being used by a lot of communities now. This is kind of the Walmart scenario. So, you know, people communities get excited about Walmart coming into the community. Walmart typically builds for a 15-year product, so they're building these large buildings that suit really primarily only their need and the, the ex expectation it will just serve a 15 year time period. And so then a lot of communities are wrestling with what do we do with the abandoned building. Um, so we're, we're looking at how, how to address that in terms of the cell towers as, as these facilities continue to evolve in terms of the technology and the infrastructure needed to support them, there will be abandoned product at the end of that. And so we want to make sure that that's being taken care of. So part of the code amendments proposed to you is that the owner needs to actually physically remove the abandoned product if it hasn't been used more than 90 days following the final day of use so that we don't end up with all these uh, extant ghost infrastructure out there. Um, th the purpose is to move to something that's a little bit more stealth in the terms of the technology. These are some of the examples of how it's being used in other communities. So there is a lot of opportunities to look at towers, um, that uh, built towers, not the cell towers, excuse me. There's a lot of ways to look at how our existing environment can accommodate this type of height that's needed for um, these types of facilities. So you see a uh, monopole that's being installed that looks like a tree in one neighborhood and then a silo that on a um, farm property that's being used as a wireless communication facility. There's also in the urban environment, there's opportunities to use clock towers or public art or to put a little um, parapet on top of an existing structure or to use flag poles. Um, there's a lot of um, uh, communities that are moving or vendors that are moving towards partnering with churches. So it's an opportunity for churches to make income and rent out the ability to put antennas on their churches and then they're disguised as crosses on the churches because it also provides height in that area as well. That's a, actually a very common application. Mm -hmm. um, and then some of the corner towers that you see in a lot of these neighborhood commercial um, buildings. Small cells are addressed in the proposed amendments as well. This is the new technology. So, so to complement the large towers that we have seen installed over the years, there's now the opportunity to bring in small cells, which um, allows for more data and more reach uh, in terms of the data. And so we are looking at how to bring that online into McMinnville. We do have some language in the proposed amendments that's looking at private property. We also have some language in the code that looks at the public right away. The intent really is the city is in dialogue with McMinnville Water and Light and Verizon, who's interested in doing a small cell product project here in McMinnville on what really good standards for that would look like. It is an emerging technology, and so it's something that 
who are learning from other communities as what's worked and what hasn't worked. And we haven't put those standards and specs together for our public right away. So we wanted to put something in this chapter that references it, but it, we all have the, the recognition that that will probably change here in the very near future. Um, Mac Water, John Dietz and I were talking about it. At, uh, he's reviewed the code, he's comfortable with it, but he also is, um, suspects that it will change as well as we work through that process. So we'll probably be bringing back amendments to you for that as we continue to refine it. Uh, but there's ways again to, and this is one of the reasons why we're wrestling with those standards is there's ways to make those stealth as well. So typically small cell technology is looking at locating on um, public right of way, utility poles, light poles, things of that nature, something that has a running pattern that's going down a corridor. Um, and there's ways to do it in such a way that it's an asset to that area and ways uh, in which it's not an asset. So we're looking at how to, how to accommodate the stealth, but also um, provide for the functionality of the technology. There's been some last conversations with Verizon over the last couple of um, weeks. And so we have some additional amendments for you that we're recommending as staff. There's four. I provided you a new ordinance that has these amendments in those, in that new ordinance. Um, one of them is relative to a radio frequency engineer. So we had in the code a requirement that a radio frequency engineer do a couple of things. One, that they provide analysis as to height. So why do you need this much height for your facility? And then also a co-location analysis. So why can't you co-locate on an existing facility? Why do you need to build a new one? Um, and we had a definition for a radio frequency engineer. We're actually recommending that we delete that. That is a um, that is an an industry that isn't that's an evolving industry. And so there, the radio frequency engineers aren't always professionally licensed engineers, um, but do have the background in which to do the work. So we didn't want to trip up the analysis by having this definition that didn't really fit into what the industry is supporting right now. Along that same line, we're um, also recommending that uh, two sections of the code that reference the need for an analysis by a radio frequency engineer be um, amended as well. One being the height section 17.55.050 subsection A subsection 2 that be amended from as demonstrated in a report prepared by an RF engineer to as demonstrated in a report prepared by a radio frequency engineer or a licensed civil engineer. So that gets that licensing requirement out, um, but provides the opportunity for a licensed engineer to participate if necessary. Same language um, we're recommending for um, an amendment in the co-location feasibility section of 17.55.070 subset T. And uh, we did a survey of other communities in the last couple of days to see how they're wrestling with this um, situation. And all have agreed that finding a licensed RF engineer is very difficult to do in Oregon. And, um, and whether the city's doing that or the vendor's doing that, they just, there aren't a lot of them because it's an emerging industry. So many other communities have moved to this type of description for the engineering for these two studies too. And then our last amendment is recommending a um, deletion in the visual impact accessory building size section of the code 17.55.050 section eight. There's a, a sentence in there that says for facilities required to be approved as stealth facilities, no fencing around the wireless or broadcast communication facility shall be allowed. These are typically proprietary equipment um, that the vendor really feels that they need to secure, we agree. Uh, we do have other places in the code where we say the fencing needs to be screened in, by landscaping or something else. So we don't feel that that will be a negative impact to where it's being located. So we, we support that deletion and recommend it as an amendment to you. Um, so as you move forward with your considerations, if, if you do choose to adopt ordinance number 5043, our recommendation is that you adopt it as amended as proposed by staff tonight. Thank you, Heather. Any uh, questions of Heather from the council? I had one. May I? Uh, go ahead, Alan, and then uh, Adam. Thank you, Heather. Well done. Uh, yeah, we've been looking on looking at this for quite some time, going back last year, 
and there doesn't seem to be any downside. Helen, could you pull your mic a little closer? There you go. Sorry. Uh, we've been looking at this since uh, mid-year last year, and there doesn't appear to be any downside to the proposed amendment and proposed uh, ordinance. Um, I did have one question. Uh, there are some gray areas that are covered by conditional use permits, mm -hmm. and you have to go through that process. Could you explain that process on how uh, elaborate it is, and is there a public hearing, is planning commission, city council? Yes, yeah, so, so the conditional use permit process is a, a land use process. So it's a land use application. It does have to meet criteria of the code. It does go through a public process. There is a public hearing at the planning commission for it. So there'll be a testimony that can be given by uh, Businesses, property owners within the afflicted, afflicted area or yeah. affected so there's, area. So there's a two-part process. So um, when if 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 a facility comes in, any facility that comes into for a land use application as a wireless facility, so that would be its own land use application, they need to do this new neighborhood meeting process. Okay. So they need to upfront notify neighbors within a certain distance and and then describe what their project is and what they're doing. So that that informational piece will already be established as part of that process, the application for the wireless facility. If they're coming in and they need to do a, a con they have a conditional use permit, then what we will do is we will then put it into our conditional use permit process. We'll then send out a mailing again, a public notice to talk as the notifying about the public hearing in front of the planning commission. So people will then have an opportunity to come and testify to the planning commission who would be making the decision. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Adam. I also had conditional use question, which you answered with Alan, but I wanted to say that the, the amendments you brought tonight sound a lot better than what we saw in November. And I just wanted to thank you and your staff for your hard work and, bring in something that seems a little bit of a better fit to the council for us to vote on tonight? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess, thank you, Councillor. I would also pass that on to the representatives from Verizon. It was a collective team effort diving into all the details, so. Okay, Sal. Yeah, I, I just had a couple of questions about some of the amendments that Verizon su suggested that are reflected in the document. Mm -hmm. if I can just ask about them. <clears throat> so one of the sets of changes that they had was to include um, conditional use for the small cell towers, um, both in residential and commercial neighborhoods, e extending the height from 10 feet to 20. What was the, the reasoning behind that? More coverage? And, and is there a more challenging process for these conditional approvals versus the normal approval process? Yeah, so, um, and actually, uh, the, one of the Verizon representatives is here tonight, and I think she'll also testify, so she might be able to answer this better than I, but um, we were really concerned about a uh, height impact in the residential areas, and I showed you that picture of the really tall tower. Um, but. For, after going through the dialogue, it was clear that they do need clearance for their facilities to talk to each other. And so they do need to get up and above the roof lines as well as the tree lines. And so the ability to, after doing an analysis, so that feasibility analysis and the residential siting analysis, if they show that they can't get that coverage by not by not being able to go above 10 feet above, then, then there's the allowance to go up to 20 feet. The 20 feet is a conditional use process, so that will be something that will go through this two-part public noticing process that we just described. So it's a little more challenging. Okay, can I ask a couple of other questions about that while, while I have you? The, um, the, the process requires notice to people within a thousand feet of the facility, as near as I could tell from what the statute said. Is there any other, um, notice that's required? Do they have to take out an ad in the newspaper or would that be a common um, requirement? 
So um, our neighborhood meeting process requires for a for a notice that they uh, notice the surrounding property owners that they also notice the site itself. So they install some sort of signage on the site saying there's a future land use process here. We do not require them to put anything into the newspaper. If there is a public hearing in front of the planning commission, the city actually puts a public notice into the newspaper to announce the public hearing and what the consideration is for that. Okay, thank you. Um, and just one other question, if I could. Um, there was a, a recommendation in there that the, the original draft that you had had some specifications for how big these cabinets could be that they would put their equipment in. And, and the, what I saw in here was that you had a recommendation of not larger than six <coughs> cubic feet, which is pretty small. And the Verizon recommendation came back to eliminate that was was that a an important consideration? Like, what's the basis for sort of them telling us not to place physical size restrictions on on this equipment? So, and again, I think the Verizon representative can answer for them. But um, the discussion evolved around um, what's the final intent of the city. So, the final intent of the city is to allow for the technology to occur and be functional and also have flexibility for how it evolves. So by putting a box around the, the size, perhaps that's restricting future use or ability for current use. And really what we wanted to do was mitigate the aesthetic standards and how it impacts the, the site on which it sits as well as the surrounding properties. So we focus more on screening or, you know, um, stealth in terms of wh how those facilities are located, so either in a building or underground or screened in some manner. So the size didn't become as important there as the screening product did. Okay, and, and the last question that I have, and I thank you for bearing with me, um, you gave some testimony about how many um, large towers that we currently have, and I don't think I heard a number, but do you know how many facilities that we're planning for? Are we gonna be seeing like one of these little things per, 10 houses, or is it going to be a much lower footprint than that? That I will have to defer to the, to the vendor. Okay. Um, I can, um, what I do know is it's going to, we're using more, so there's going to be more infrastructure to support the program. And, and what that infrastructure looks like is changing the, the whole discussion of cell towers versus small cells. That's, that's a new discussion and, and something that a lot of the vendors are moving towards. Um, so I, I think we're going to continue to see that. Thanks for answering my questions. Council President. Uh, just one question about the public meeting process, and for some reason it just seems to me I need this clarification. We're going to have a public meeting in all of the, in most of these situations. Does that actually have to be uh, organized by the planning department, or can it just be between the contractor and the, the people? So the first public meeting, the neighborhood meeting, is, is organized by the applicant. Okay. Uh, it happens as part of the application process. Um, so what we, in fact, we're working through one right now. So it's new, it just came online. It was adopted December 12th. It became effective January 12th. So we're, we're implementing it now. Um, what we have agreed to do is if people are struggling to do, uh, so right now we're doing one with a vacation home rental. If people are struggling to do, to find the addresses, put together a mailing spreadsheet for them, that's very <coughs> easy for us to do. So we're offering that as a service. But it's really, they're responsible for doing the mailing, for running the meeting, for providing the information, and then providing to us what they provided to the neighbors. Will an accounting the, uh, of it? Will a member of the planning department have to be there for these initial? We're going to be notified of them, and it'll be our choice to go or not. We would just go as an observer, not a participant. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Wendy. Um, on the permitted locations, there were a number of towers that you showed that were over 100 feet, and you mentioned that um, they, there would be the ability to go over 100 feet in industrial. Was that through conditional use permit? No, that's, that's through going through a feasibility analysis. So by federal law, we cannot prevent the opportunity for this technology to come into the community and, and be able to operate. 
<laughs> um, so if there's if there is a feasibility analysis done that describes that they need to be taller than 100 feet, that and they can show that through either this RF engineer or licensed civil engineer, then th that that will be allowed in industrial zones. Mm -hmm. With that, okay. Yeah. And, um, and currently, the regulations have no maximum height right now. Okay. Um, for the stealth technology, you mentioned both for the smaller um, cell towers as well as the larger ones moving towards that. Can you say just a little bit more about what that looks like to move t towards it? Is there more research that we are going to be doing? No, the, the amendments require it. So for a lot of the locations now, if, if um, something is going to be installed the, on these alternative antenna support structures, so in the residential areas or the commercial zones or the downtown zones, they have to be stealth. That could look like two different things, right? So if it's co-locating, let's, t let's talk about the fire district cell tower. If it's co-locating on the fire station cell tower, for it to come in as something that looks other than what it's co-locating on, that doesn't make any sense, right? right. But if it's, if it's co-locating on an existing, you saw an antenna on third and forward, then we want it to look like what it's co-locating on. If it's coming in as new, we want it to be stealth. So that's the example is those, um, the cross-themed facilities that you're seeing on churches now. So that question will come will come up for everyone that comes through mm -hmm. after this passes. Yes, except for the industrial zones. So in the industrial zones, you can come in and you install a, a tower, okay. a, a traditional tower. And and the intent is is that's where we want those. So we're, we're trying to make that as easy as possible <coughs> for them to go there. Okay, very well done, very thorough. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, Heather, I have one question in, in a part of your presentation you talked about county agricultural lands and I was my understanding is that we do have um, installations <laughs> on agricultural lands within the county yeah so this is no so uh, and I apologize if I've confused the issue so we have in the city of McMinnville, we have an agricultural holding zone. It's okay. not really an urban zone. Okay. Um, what it is, it's it, it's land. It's allowing for land to be brought into the city that's been farmed okay. and isn't ready for development yet. So it can continue to be farmed until it's ready for <clears throat> development. That's the agricultural holding zone. Um, so what we wanted to do is, since there is property in the city that is under that zoning allowance, we wanted to make sure one that we accommodated the technology. But two, we were also cognizant of the fact that the future use of that property was not farming. And these installations, once they're in, development happens around them. It doesn't, you don't take them down and then develop. So we wanted to make sure that the, the infrastructure that's installed there will be compatible with what, whatever the planned future development for that area is per the comp plan. So we do have a comp plan for how we intend for the agricul agricultural holding zone to develop. That's exactly what I was getting towards, and again, you've answered that, so thank you. Um, hearing no further questions um, from counselors, are there any individuals in the audience who would like to speak in favor of the proposal? And I do have uh, a public comment card, and is it Meredith uh, Pabst? If you'd come up. And counselors, you have some written testimony from uh, from a wireless policy group as a part of your packet, but we have uh, the author of that. So, Merrily, if you'd uh, address the council. Yes, thank you, uh, Mayor Hill and counselors. Um, I'm Meredy Pabst, here tonight on behalf of Verizon Wireless. And first, we'd like to thank you for allowing this additional time for us to work with staff and helping refine and further develop um, the code prior to final approval. Um, we really appreciate your setting this hearing in January to allow for that collaboration. We'd also like to thank staff, especially Ms. Richards and Mr. Darnell. They were both very generous with their time. Um, they carefully reviewed our suggested changes and they gave us fair consideration um, of our concerns. Staff didn't agree with all of our suggested changes, but we do feel that with regard to Verizon's higher priority items, um, we reached a, a reasonable solution that works for, on the industry side as well as protecting the aesthetics in the city. 
Um, one of the more important changes, and you've already spoken about it some tonight, is this revised code does restore the allowance for the additional 20 feet for rooftop installations in both residential and commercial zones. And um, this is a, a critical option for carriers to provide adequate service throughout the city. Um, as is also discussed, new towers are strictly limited to the industrial zones. Um, so in order to to serve all areas of the city, especially the um, residential areas that are pretty remote from the industrial zoned property, carriers need an option to get up above um, rooftops in residential and commercial zones. And the city's interests um, in aesthetics are now protected by the stealthing requirements. So as you've also discussed, when an applicant um, comes in, it will be designing its rooftop installation to appear as a penthouse or some architectural um, feature or otherwise fit into the built environment. Um, this code, um, Verizon also supports this revised code as a foundation for small cells. And as Ms. Richards um, explained, um, this is something of a work in progress in the city of McMinnville. Um, McMinnville Water and Light or is it Water and, water and Power? Water I, think and I, always, light, yes. I always get it wrong. Um, owns a significant number of the poles in the city. Um, so ultimately, the designs are going to come down to a collaboration between the carrier, the pole owner, and the city from a zoning perspective. And um, Verizon look, work, looks forward to working further with city and utility staff um, to find some standards that will work from everyone's perspective. Um, do you have any questions? I, I think Councillor Peralta, you had a question about infrastructure, and I'm not sure I remember what you asked, but... The, I, I had a few questions, but the main question I had related to the height of the, um, the, the, the rooftop sightings that you were describing, that 10 feet wasn't adequate and, and 20 feet maybe is... Oh. <laughs> No, you. It helps if this is on, right? Did you hear what I did? You hear what I said? Yeah, yeah. And um, the the proposed code that was before council in November didn't allow any height at all on rooftops in residential zones, and 10 feet were was permitted outright in commercial. And so this added change allows the 20 feet, but only if the applicant goes through the conditional use process and has a well designed facility. Can you step me through? Um, in what ways the data is changing to the, the point where we're going to need to add additional infrastructure? Like how much additional infrastructure are we talking about? How many of these small uh, uh, facilities are we talking about on rooftops? If there's, you know, 10,000 households in this town, how many of them are going to have? Well, you're asking a question outside my expertise. Um, but um, I can tell you, generally speaking, carriers are proceeding with developing both new macro sites and installing small cells. And small cell cells are very useful for addressing areas of high need, so where there's a dense population. Um, so in downtown areas, or um, you might see this similarly in a, a stadium where there's a lot of people and you, your phone says that you have coverage but it won't work. That's a capacity issue because there's so many people there with devices. And so approaches like DAS and small cell by installing very small antennas throughout a stadium or throughout a downtown core can help pick up that extra capacity. And so they work together. There's a layer of macro and then um, small cell below. And of course, the technology is changing all the time. There's a lot of talk about, you know, self-driving cars and 5G. And so, you know, these things will continue to evolve over time in order to serve, you know, the community. Thank you, Sal. Any other questions? Hearing none, thank you. Thank you all. Do we have anyone else in the audience that would like to participate um, in this public hearing that is in favor of our discuss of the what's before us this evening? Okay, hearing none. Is there anyone who wishes to speak in opposition to this proposal? Seeing none. Um, for those that have testified this evening, do any of you wish 
to request that this hearing be continued in order to present additional evidence, arguments, or testimony record, uh, regarding the application. Not seeing any. Um, Does the city council wish to continue uh, to uh, to con continue or to close the hearing? Close. We move to close the hearing. Close. Okay. Um, does council wish to have any further discussion with the applicant? Okay. Well, we're ready for a motion. I move that. We, we close the hearing yep. and, and proceed to deliberation. Okay, and a second? Second. second. It has been moved by Council President Menke and seconded to with uh, Councilor Stassens and the motion uh, for this motion to be voted on. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed motion to the motion say nay. This is a... Uh, this this passes uni uh, unanimously five to five. Zero. Oh, five to zero. Yes, <laughs> five to zero. Thank you. Okay. This takes us to our ordinances this evening. We will now consider the matter of ordinance number fifty forty three. Does any councilor object to having this ordinance read by title only? City Attorney, would you uh, take us to the second rating of Ordinance 5043? Yes, Mr. Mayor. This is the second reading uh, of Ordinance Number 5043. <coughs> Excuse me. An ordinance amending Title 17 of the McMinnville City Code, specific to Chapter 17.06 definitions and 17.55 wireless communications facilities to help achieve a more desirable community aesthetic while ensuring co compliance with. Current Federal Communications Commission FCC regulations. Thank you, David. I'm going to ask for a motion to ad adopt um, Ordinance Number 5043. So, so second. And seconded. Uh, it has been moved by uh, 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 Councillor Garvin and seconded by Councillor Stassens. I'll ask the city recorder to poll the council. Councillor Garvin? Aye. Councillor Peralta? Aye. Councillor Rudin? Aye. Councillor Stassens? Aye. Council President Mankey? Aye. Okay, this, uh, this proposal or this ordinance passes this unanimously. Thank you for all the hard work, uh, Heather and your, your staff and, and for the council for keeping up on this. Uh, tonight we have two presentations, and so we will uh, ask the Downtown Safety Task Force to give an update. Uh, Chief and Susan, if you'd come and do that for us. <coughs> Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mayor Hill and members of the council, this is our second task force update. Uh, as you recall, we uh, have been tasked with uh, meeting with community members that were appointed by the, the, the council to uh, take a look at behaviors that uh, are perceived and real uh, within our city that we have been, uh, uh, that we were, that the council heard uh, testimony on in July a couple of times. So uh, this is our update. Uh, as you can uh, see, uh, our members are still the same uh, as they were the first, I believe, Jeff Sargent's here tonight. Um, but uh, our group continues to meet on a, on a fairly regular basis. I believe we met th between three and four times uh, this last uh, session before, uh, since our last uh, update. Um, since the last update in November, um, our surveys closed and uh, the results were reviewed with our, uh, our task force. Uh, we have had brainstorming sessions uh, to uh, find potential solutions to the problems that were uh, seen within that uh, survey or that came forth from the survey. Uh, we've had presentations from the Mac City pastors. Uh, we had uh, a pretty lengthy uh, presentation by Officer Height, who, as you recall, uh, has been working downtown uh, for between two and three hours uh, during his shift throughout the week. Uh, this was done, as you recall, to help uh, uh, 
uh, ensure our presence was felt down there. Uh, since that time, we've uh, also ranked proposed solution, and you'll see some brainstorming slides later on uh, how we came to some. Uh, we've identified pros and cons for the solutions, uh, some initial pros and cons, I should say, and we've continued to improve the web page. Uh, again, if you would uh, ever have free time, uh, please free, feel free to look up uh, the Downtown Safety Task Force and some of the information that we're providing to our citizens and uh, community. Um, I think Susan's going to take over the survey portion of it. Good evening, Mayor and Councilors. Uh, we, as you know, the last time when we checked in with you, we were just kicking off the survey and we had just released it. Uh, after it closed, we found that we had over 200 people take the survey. I've put a handout at your uh, places that includes the full results of the survey. Um, but the Chief and I thought we would just go through a couple of findings tonight and give you a pretty high level view of what we think um, we gleaned out of that and the information that the committee is using or the task force is using to move forward. Um, if you recall, we emailed the survey to the South of Downtown Neighborhood Association and uh, we went door to door and delivered flyers in the North area since there is an organized neighborhood association there. And we also posted it to our webpage and emailed it out um, through the McMinnville Downtown Association. So here's what the survey looks like when we got it back. Uh, you can see that we had a lot of people who were employees of the downtown businesses take the survey, 46% did. 20% uh, of the people that took the survey were living in downtown, 18% were downtown business owners, and then we had um, some people who selected they were other or visitors or shoppers. So that's the group uh, that we are going to be looking at how they felt about downtown. And keep in mind, we really focused their um, the survey on the summer of 2017. So we were really trying to drill down on what the behaviors were and how quantifiable they were for the summer that you heard the most comments on. Uh, so we kept reminding them of that. Uh, so this is one of the questions that is really deals with the perception issue of the safety in downtown. Uh, we asked the question, how many times did you or your employees personally feel unsafe in your downtown? Uh, so you can see we gave the options of always, and thankfully that um, slice of the pie is pretty small. Um, often and sometimes are a little larger, and then never and seldom the blue and the green pieces of the uh, pie chart are uh, 16 and 21 percent. And as the committee and the ta or the task force moves their recommendations forward, and if you if you adopt those as we go through this process, the goal here would be to see the blue and the green grow uh, over the years as we implement any changes to the. Um, behavior so that we can uh, get that perception of feeling safe in our downtown to, to change a little bit from what you heard from the summer of 2017. There were some clear, clear results of the survey and some that weren't so clear. This one was pretty clear. Uh, we asked how much communication people either read, uh, saw, or heard about regarding what efforts were underway to improve the downtown issues that they were seeing. And you can see uh, we the blue and the green pieces of that pie indicate that there was really too little or no communication reaching the people or um, that they were understanding or seeing or hearing. So we have some work to do there. And as the chief indicated, we've already made some changes on the web page in order to address that and expect to continue to build on that so that we can communicate um, a lot better and build some of those bridges to what we are doing with the reality that people are feeling out there. So that one was clear. Uh, and we're really gathering baseline data here so that we can look and compare for years going forward. So here's another example of one. We asked how many times did you or your employees seal, see or deal with camping or loitering on your property? And that might be a little hard to read, but um, you can see uh, the majority of people that responded one to five times to, had to deal with that over the summer. Um, and again, we'd like to see that bottom bar grow over time uh, in order to change the perception of feeling safe in our downtown. So um, we have some quantifiable things that we can hopefully put some measures in place as part of the recommendation of the task force um, to see these change over time. Uh, 
this one, the dreaded question, how many times did you or your employees deal with urine or human waste on your property? Um, we were happy to see that zero times scored pretty high on that percentage of 59%. Um, but again, you know, dealing with this one time uh, as a resident or a business owner is a, a lot and can have a very negative impact on how you perceive um, what's happening in downtown. So again, we'd like to see that blue really grow uh, over the next uh, couple of years and really continue to see the orange and the yellow pieces of that slide, uh, that pie shrink a little bit. Uh, this, I combined two answers to look at the results of uh, one question we asked, how often did you see a police presence in downtown? And we asked another one, how often did you see a park ranger in downtown over the summer? Uh, so the blue bars indicate the police presence and their visibility and the kind of off-white color um, bar shows the park ranger presence. Uh, so the chief and I have seen um, some, you know, we clearly see this, the um, perception issue um, and seeing the rangers certainly in downtown. And we've already talked about some changes that we will be implementing for next summer, just administratively um, that we can do to increase that perception of the rangers. And um, this was done, the survey was done before the changes that the chief made to allocating officer height, I believe down there. So um, we've already made some changes to hopefully try and uh, sway those blue bars a little bit to the right and also next summer we'll plan on doing that with the um, ranger presence as well. Okay, I'll uh, it to the chief, go ahead. Uh, just uh, some quick uh, snapshots of our brain brainstorming exercise, uh, uh, prioritizing. Uh, uh, our group met and uh, She's a brainstormer, Susan is, so she had this exercise. Uh, the group took part in uh, finding some, uh, priori prioritizing what was uh, the issues that they were dealing with and then some potential solutions. Um, uh, as you can see uh, on the, the slide on the right, you're right, uh, drugs and alcohol, excuse me, uh, and smoking. Uh, you can, you'll see uh, in our, uh, our recommendations, I think moving forward, that they really saw a smoking uh, ordinance ban or at least taking a look at there, there was some, so there was some traction to that within our group to see if that would uh, help with some issues uh, that we were seeing downtown. Uh, and uh, this is, again is our uh, web page that we put in. Uh, you can see now we've included uh, those that have been excluded in the downtown core area, the, desert, the downtown enforcement zone, um, working with uh, Officer Height and the courts uh, and our, our patrol officers. Uh, Officer Height uh, has seen uh, a marked decrease in the number of, uh, I would say, behavioral people that would cause the a majority of the behavioral issues downtown. Uh, anecdotally, I will say that I received calls or feedback from our business owners, residents uh, who have visited downtown. They've seen a marked decrease uh, in problematic behavior. So that's that's uh, been a plus. But again, I encourage you to visit, visit that website. Uh, the, the slide on the right uh, is uh, what we will routinely put in uh, uh, every week or two. Uh, you'll get updates with uh, the what we're seeing with as far as activity downtown. Uh, that Officer Height sees. Uh, that would include now the library. He's included that into his routine. Uh, so again, feel free to take a look at those uh, at that website and, and gather as much information as you can. Uh, next steps for our task force. We meet uh, two more times in February. Uh, we're going to see us come to uh, some recommendations, uh, short, short and long-term solutions, and how we're going to measure the success. Uh, we're, again, we'll return uh, in March towards the end with a final product for uh, you all to take a look at, possibly seeing some recommendations like I've sort of hinted to. But uh, again, this is uh, the Citizens Task Force uh, and those that are on this. Uh, and I will say that a number of the members have, have taken a, a lot of their personal free time to go downtown talk to the business owners, talk to other people that frequent downtown. So this is a really engaging uh, task force that's trying to uh, get to the, get to some real solutions I think will work. So with that, questions? Uh, Any questions of um, Matt or Susan? I have one. Go ahead, Wendy. Um, thank you for all your hard work. It's really good to see the in numbers. Um, it's kind of enlightening to see how people answer. Um, what, how, other than the survey, do ha, have you gotten the word out about the website and what kind of traffic have you seen on that website? We, we actually, Susan had mentioned that just the other day. We need to, 
talk to Scott and see how much traffic we're Great, getting there. You can track we, that. We need to, uh, whether it's uh, increasing it visible on the web, uh, on the city web page, being able to make it an uh, initial click, I think that's important. I think uh, some talk between ourselves is that maybe working with the news register to uh, uh, get our message out that way and, and really let the citizens know what we're doing and how the city's addressing the issues and what we're actually seeing downtown uh, to take sort of those, uh, uh, those, uh, um, those uh, urban legends out of the out of the way for us, but also telling the story about how the city's uh, handling this problem. Yeah, I was I've gone through it, and I'm impressed with the work that you guys have done, and it seems to lend itself to that communication concern that people have. Yeah. So we, uh, I think we've been, we had been siloed for a number of years, and the, the ability for us to tell our story through this web page is going to be really important. Yeah. Uh, I think moving forward. And I would just add that um, the McMinnville Downtown Association, uh, we know that they're getting information about this and using that website, particularly the one with the exclusion zones or the people who have been <coughs> excluded um, to keep their eyes on the street and uh, they're a good resource for that. So we know that they're engaging on that piece of it, but to quantify that would be great. So we'll, we'll work on getting a counter or find, finding that out. And that was my other question on the exclusions. How does that work? How long are they on that list? And how do they get on that list? That's a, that's a great question. It's really up to the, the judge. Uh, if, a, if a person commits a crime, doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be excluded in, that, uh, in the enhanced in, uh, the economic district that, we're, that we uh, have been, that's been framed within that ordinance. <laughs> Uh, it's uh, if the if it's an uh, issue, the court will decide upon conviction as part of the probation uh, what uh, the time frame is that they're going to be excluded from. So there have been some that are excluded. I, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Natalie, but I believe upwards of 180 days at a minimum. Mm -hmm. And I know, but there's also uh, if the person, if a person, in an example, does what they're expected to do, they can come off that exclusion uh, zone. Um, quicker, uh, much quicker, if they if they take steps to to do things that the court has uh, asked them to do. So, I believe it's upwards of 180 days. Okay, great, thanks. Thank you, Wendy. Any other questions or comments? <coughs> Just uh, thank you for all your hard work. You know, uh, from my perspective, and much like Wendy, I, I go into your report on a weekly basis, and I've seen trends. I was very, um, I was very pleased to hear the report by uh, Officer Height and how he shared this process that he's gone through. Uh, when he was first assigned, I don't think it was something that he <laughs> says, yeah, I'm, I'm real happy to do this. But to see his attitude change, and he says now, frequently as he's walking, he's out, individuals will come up to talk to him and update him. And, and, and from his perspective, there's a marked difference. There's a marked difference. And I know we're in the wintertime and it's not summertime, but as we, you know, days get warmer and as we're moving down, I think we're in a much better place than we have been in, in many, many years. And so, again, I take my hat off to that citizens committee. I mean, they're working hard, they represent, and we have individuals from all, uh, all aspects of life that are doing that. And you know, as we're going and looking at ordinances that affect the whole city, it's so critical that we we do this in the right, proper way, where we bring citizens in because we're making changes that could affect people for years and years down the road. And so uh, this thoughtful way about going will allow us to have ordinances that are right for this time for the long for the long term. And so I'm looking forward to, you know, the months ahead where we come to a conclusion and and have input from many. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We, we have another presentation. Uh, we have our mid-year budget report. And so our finance director, uh, Marsha, if you'd come up and uh, address the council. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and councilors. Uh, as we do every year, this time of year, uh, we are here tonight to give you a 
High level view of uh, where we are in the current fiscal year budget, 2017-18. And also to let you know, we've updated the forecast and to take a look at that. Um, so of course the first uh, step in the process is looking at the beginning balance, which is basically the carryover from the prior fiscal year. <coughs> It is quite a bit higher than we had anticipated. Um, a couple of reasons for that. One being that our property tax revenue was more than we had estimated. And we had uh, personal services savings in police and fire and uh, parks maintenance departments. Uh, you might remember that we had budgeted for some positions in park maintenance that we didn't fill. And the savings in police and fire were primarily vacant positions. Uh, revenues also were uh, higher than what we had budgeted. We did not put in the budget any numbers for state and local marijuana tax because we really didn't know at the time what those numbers might be. Uh, we also did not put in the budget the franchise rate uh, increases that uh, were adopted by the council for Northwest Natural and Recology. And we also did not include in the budget the transient lodging tax rate increase, which went from 8% to 10% and then included um, the RV park. However, we did include those very uh, high level estimates of those numbers in the, in the forecast. Um, so for expenditures for 2017-18, the, the biggest change there was the uh, staffing level changes that were uh, added, the two positions that were added in the police department during 1718. The other change to the forecast expenditures uh, was updating the PERS rates for information that we recently got from PERS. Uh, the table that was on the first page uh, shows the, um, in the uh, center column there, the forecast that was based on the adopted budget. So this would have been the budget that we brought to you when we uh, last May, when we talked about the 1718 budget. And then on the far right is the forecast based on these mid-year estimates with the adjustments that I just mentioned. You can see really they're, they're fairly similar. Uh, the reason why 1718 is higher with the mid-year estimates is the impact of the revenues that we did not include in the budget. Um, really not a lot of variance. Um, you will see that then as we get into the uh, later years that um, we are, you know, five years out. It's a little hard to predict, but we did see some impact from the PERS rate increases in 21 that 2021 that were a little bit higher than what we had actually projected. You will also see that uh, we, we may, we're projecting that we could reach that 25% threshold that we have adopted as our fund balance policy uh, by the end of 2018-19. But there's a couple of things to consider there. Uh, and one is at, you know, the GFO has best practices and, and one of those addresses um, what the general fund reserve could be something that we should think about. There are several factors that they mention. Uh, of course, at a minimum, the reserve should be sufficient to uh, meet your cash flow needs. Um, for our general fund, that minimum level for cash, just cash flow needs is about 17%. And then the other thing um, I think that's really important to think about here is the, um, the uh, strategic planning initiative that um, will be, uh, has already been kicked off and uh, that that really, I expect that will have a pretty significant impact on the reserve as we uh, pursue additional revenue resources. So challenge for the future, the, the um, thing that's at the top of the everyone's mind in our finance world is the PERS rates. Uh, and everybody, I think, across the state of Oregon is facing this uh, challenge. So you, if you've been following in the uh, news, you may know that uh, the governor has established a PERS 
Unfunded Actuarial Liability Task Force, or UAL Task Force, and they've identified actually a number of options, and some of them, as you may know, are fairly creative. Um, they talked about using some of the reserve for the SAFE Corporation, uh, some one-time windfall income, uh, using unclaimed property uh, revenue that's now going to the Common School Fund, uh, increasing state alcohol revenues, privatizing public universities, increasing lottery revenue, using some of the rainy day fund. So they're, I think, trying to think outside of the box. But the, the option that's getting the most traction right now is the employer incentive fund. So the employer incentive fund would be structured to uh, allow uh, employers to, they're actually a special type of side account. So a side account is what's created if, as the employer, we were to make a lump sum payment to PERS. And uh, PERS puts that money in a, in a side account for us. And then uh, in the future years, as our rates go up, that side account basically is used to offset the increases um, going forward. Um, and possibly we might earn a better rate of return with PERS than we would uh, where our money is invested now in LGIP. That's uh, not necessarily a given, of course. So the, the side accounts, the, the, what would be really different and makes them very interesting right now for in the employer invest incentive fund is that PERS would match employer contributions 25 cents on the dollar. So that makes that option interesting. <clears throat> uh, Mark Dunmire, who is the finance director for Water and Light, did go to a workshop recently where there was a discussion about this fund. And I did want to make one correction to my memo where I had said that side accounts could be funded with cash on hand or with loan or bond proceeds. Well, the, the way it is um, set up currently, uh, these side accounts could only be funded with cash on hand but the presenters at the workshop seem to feel that, you know, there's a lot of details that they're still working out. And uh, a lot of uh, jurisdictions do not have cash on hand uh, to be able to do that. And there uh, might be, probably would be a lot of interest in being allowed to use bond or loan proceeds to fund those side accounts. And Marcia, this is all gonna be brought up in the short session? Uh, the I believe so, yes. Okay. Yes. Um, so uh, we'll keep you posted on all of those options and where that goes. Uh, we know that there is a um, potential for some uh, issue, you know, the, the advantage is that we have been aware. PERS has been very proactive with letting us know that rates will increase. Uh, they've been uh, letting us know that they probably will increase the maximum amount they're allowed to with the, the collar that they use, um, which kind of smooths out the increases. Um, so we've been anticipating that that will happen. Um, and then there is a positive side, of course, to uh, looking ahead. The, the state and local marijuana tax revenues um, are really have been really inconsistent with the um, distributions that we've got, both for the state and local. Um, the the time frames are uh, um, one turnover might be for two months, uh, another turnover was for three months. One, of course, the the state was for a year and a half after they had paid for their cost to set up this uh, collection of the taxes. So. We do think still that will probably be about what we put in the budget, which was 40 to 50,000 local and um, 150 state, but it's really hard to say. And they're not real forthcoming with information either on uh, what makes up those tax distributions. Um, and then property tax revenue has been pretty consistent. We've seen about a 4% increase in the, over the last several years. Uh, and um, of course the strategic planning process, which um, as I'd mentioned, really I think will be really critical in um, helping us to determine how we're going to uh, fund some of the challenges that we are facing as we go ahead. And finally, the departments are 
currently working on their budgets for 2018-19. So we'll be bringing those proposed budgets for 2018-19 to the budget committee on May 16th. So I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Any questions for Marsha? I did, I had one. Go ahead, Adam. Um, thank you, Marsha. Uh, can you go back to the original uh, graph that showed the percentage of the uh, general fund? The, the table. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there it is. So by the, I knew we were gonna start going a negative way. So is that estimate for the 1920, um, 16 to 19 percent, is that that would be the general fund reserve of our budget? That's correct. And if it goes unabated, we'll be down to two to five percent in the next four years? Three to five year estimates, of course, are estimates and, and very rough projections. Mm -hmm. uh, what What is in those numbers, what's reflected in those numbers is the additional revenues that are in place now, the uh, increase in the franchise fees, the transient lodging tax. What is in, not in those numbers is any of the uh, other options that we've talked about for additional revenues like business license or specialty licenses or other franchise fees. So um, that's where I think the strategic planning and those discussions going forward will uh, really be important because um, Again, those numbers do not reflect any additional revenues that we might identify going forward. Am I reading this wrong or something? So 1920 got an adopted budget of 17%. Uh, and then 12 and 6. And then so the estimates for the mid-year, <clears throat> uh, how, how bad is it? I guess I, we've been talking about uh, creating more revenue streams that we're going to be needing them because of this PERS issue that's coming upon us quickly. Uh, but how bad are we? How does that? Uh, I guess, um, and, and maybe the city manager would like to address that as well, but I guess um, if we do nothing, um, we're looking at a, a pretty significant decrease in our general fund. We, even 16 to 19% might be a reserve that some cities would be very happy to have. Yeah. And we certainly and have been much higher than that. Um, 16 to 19% isn't a, 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 not necessarily a crisis. So would you have anything to add to that, Jeff? Yeah, I, it's just to... Just to emphasize what Marcia said is the, the you know when you get to three and four years out and you assume uh, no proactive decisions on either the revenue or the expenditure side, anytime there's a structural imbalance, you're going to see that number get a lot worse. But the what that tells us is that we'll have to make some decisions between now and three and four years from now, and that's really ample time to uh, to make those decisions either on the revenue or expenditure side or both to level those numbers out. And thus, um, Alan, the strategic plan with a heavy emphasis on, on financing and that process. Um, you know, we have been able to weather some major storms over the last uh, decade and have been, have come through just because of the conservative nature that we do. And, and we just need to do it again. We need to really fine tune the expense portion, but we've got to get creative in the revenue piece and making sure the the programs we're involved in are paying their way if they're made to do it that way and and really have a, a holistic approach as we look at this. I don't think there's anything that's off the table other than probably PERS. I don't know that we have control over that, but you know we're gonna we're gonna need to really zero in so that when we're sitting here uh, someone sitting here in 2021, uh, they're going to look and we're back up into that, you know, 17, 18, 19 percent reserve. And so the, um, the clock is ticking, so to speak, on our, yeah. uh, so our strategic planning is, is critical coming up over the next couple of years for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Wendy? Um, Marcia, does that take into account any like nat natural growth like in revenues that would occur as a result of property tax increases or growth in the com community? 
or is it just flat revenue? When we build the forecast, we do make assumptions about uh, a lot of things, including what uh, the CPI will be in, in the COLA, for example. That's one of the more important assumptions that we make. In the forecast currently, we have held property tax revenue, which of course is you know our most significant revenue in the general fund. We've held that increase at 4%. Pretty conservative. Possibly, depending, I guess, on um, uh, some of the things that you know Heather is working on and the planning department is working on, um, we we have benefited, I think, from being conservative um, to put more than a four percent increase in for the next five years when that's what we've seen for the last three or four years. I think is reasonable. So our. <coughs> Our goal really is always to be conservative while still um, not painting such a dire picture that we are uh, making decisions about staffing and, and city needs that are, are based on um, uh, estimates that are extremely conservative. So that's the balance that we're always looking for. And I guess I'll, I'll add to that. I mean, when you uh, when you look at the, <coughs> these three or four years going forward, I understand why it creates some concern and anxiety. When you look in the rearview mirror to what's happened in the last eight or ten years, it sort of rounds out the picture a little bit. We tend to be really conservative and not very speculative on the revenue side. We tend to presume that we're going to spend most of what we plan to spend and our reality over a long period of time is that we usually end up being a little better off on both the revenue and the expenditure side so when we did our ratings call with moody this moody's this week and looked at our reserve over, over the last eight years uh, with, with the exception of a couple of years where we had some some loan proceeds to deal with our reserves were really remarkably stable. We didn't see this kind of a trend in those actual numbers. And so I'm not, um, I'm not complacent. I think the council's going to have some significant issues to think through and some decisions to make, but I don't think we're really in a precarious position at this point. We'll put Jeff. <coughs> Saul. First of all, thank you for putting me on the excellent. I'll say it so everybody can hear. Um, thank you for putting together a really excellent um, document. It was easy for me as someone coming in new to understand it, and I really appreciate that. Um, in your document, you identify three or four um, new revenue sources that you hadn't budgeted for but were included in the visioning, and you've identified PERS as the main driver of costs that or what get us to this 6%. What other drivers of costs are there besides PERS? And does anything like remotely reach that scale in terms of m your estimates that take us from a 22% reserve to a 6% reserve? For, ex <coughs> for expenditures, we what we've seen with health insurance is that, uh, you know, we've seen anywhere from 12% increases to more recently, four, five, six percent increases. So after PERS, medical insurance is the is the uh, most expensive fringe benefit for us. One thing that is not uh, incorporated into this forecast is that we learned just this week that the the CPI, which is the the COLA um, for employees, is 3.6%. It's been around 2%. So 3.6, um, I haven't had time to calculate what that actually means, uh, especially, for example, in the police department, which is you know, 85%. Actually, in the general fund, about 80% of all costs are staff. First, yeah, yeah. So, so that's something that we'll want to keep an eye on as well. Um, that's not been the in other parts of the country. It's not been that high, so it may not stay that high. We'll we'll see. That's something I I think we'll need to keep an eye on. Thank you. Yes. Any other questions? Thank you, Marsha. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate that.
that takes us to our resolutions and our first resolution in front of us this evening is 2018-2 and that has to do with uh, appointments for uh, vacancies on our city budget committee and um, at this particular time we have two vacancies um, and uh, those vacancies were advertised in the news register on December 8th and December 12th. We received two applications for those positions. We received an application from Mr. John Mead and Sherry Markwood uh, because Mr. Mead had been on the budget committee and had many years of experience. We determined that there was no need to go out and re um, interview Mr. Mead, uh, but uh, myself and C Council President Menke and a member of our audit committee, uh, Mr. Uh, Peter Hofstad, the CEO of the hospital, uh, who is also on the budget committee, had an opportunity to meet on January 10th and uh, and to interview um, Miss Markwood, and we were just very, very pleased with her background, her education, and what she'll bring to the budget committee. And so the staff and um, uh, the but the audit committee would recommend that these two individuals uh, be um, uh, put onto the budget committee for a period of three years, or is this a four-year? It's a three-year period. Uh, any questions? Uh, Kelly was a part of that uh, uh, interviewing panel, but any questions that you would have, Alan? Yeah, I, I know John's not here, but um, <coughs> how about the other appointee? Are there anybody here? You mean those two? Sam or? Uh, uh, Sh uh, Shelley, Sherry. Oh. No? Oh, she's not here tonight. Okay. <laughs> I don't recognize a couple of people out here, so I thought it might right, be right. No. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Any other questions? Hearing none, um, <coughs> resolution 2018-2, a resolution apporting, uh, uh, appointing Mr. John Mead and Miss Sherry Markwood as representatives of the um, City of McMinnville Budget Committee. And... Um, um, again, we've had the discussion. Sorry, Marcia, I took your little role there, but <laughs> <laughs> you know, if I would read ahead, sometimes it would really, really help. <laughs> but I just saved us a little time. Um, so I'm going to ask for a motion to approve resolution 2018-2. So moved. Second. It has been moved by uh, Councillor Rudin and uh, seconded by uh, Council President Menke. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed signify by saying nay. <coughs> this resolution passes unanimously. Okay, resolution 2018-3, a resolution of the City of McMinnville accepting the annual report or the annual financial report for the City uh, Urban Renewal Agency for fiscal year ending <laughs> June 30th, 2017. Uh, as per Oregon revised statute 457-460. Uh, Marsha, we will have you come up and just uh, update us a little. Actually, I would like uh, Heather to talk about that. She, she drafted the report. Uh, Heather drafted the report and I gave her some numbers to put in the report. Heather, we'd oh. love to have you report to us. <laughs> I can defer to Marsha. <laughs> <laughs> so see, when I read, I get in trouble too. <laughs> so um, Mayor and City Councilors, in your role as uh, for the City of McMinnville as an agency, um, per ORS, you are to accept a annual report from the McMinnville Urban Renewal Agency um, before the end of January based on the previous fiscal year. And the intention of this report is really to um, describe what sort of resources were collected to support the Urban Renewal Agency, how those resources were expended, and then impact to overlapping taxing districts because Urban Renewal is all about the, the collection of foregone revenue for other overlapping taxing districts. Um, since we're still early on in, in the um, life of this Urban Renewal Plan and District, our property tax collections for last fiscal year was about 
a little over $176,000. Um, we did leverage uh, and pledge future uh, revenue to a bond to be able to partner with the city uh, and do the Alpine Avenue improvement. So you see that in there as a resource um, as well. And then there's interest income and miscellaneous is one of our um, programs that we're putting together under the property assistance program where people um, apply for free design assistance. Um, in terms of where the funds were expended, a, a large chunk of the funds was spent on the first part of the Alpine Avenue improvement. So some of that's design, some of that's actually construction underway. Um, and then we did, we funded um, half of the parking study, which just recently got concluded. Uh, we did some facade improvement grants, administration, and then financing costs for the bonds. Um, our long-term obligations are described there as well in terms of how we've pledged those funds thus far in terms of that one bond uh, that we've done for the Alpine Avenue improvements. And then over the life of the plan, we'll start to see some of these layer on top of each other as the increment c continues to grow and we can leverage it towards other uh, bonds to move other projects forward. We're also responsible for reporting what this fiscal year's budget is in terms of um, what we have forecasted for resources and how we forecasted to expend those. Very similar discussion in terms of um, the primary project is Alpine Avenue improvements and that's mostly being funded by with bond revenue. Uh, also brought into this year is uh, the third street improvement project that we wanna start to launch in terms of a community discussion. So leveraging some funds for that. And then we um, put more money into our development assistance program because the intent of urban renewal is to stimulate new construction. So you're generating more taxes to be able to pay for future year projects. And so, as you know, we partnered in the Atticus Hotel project, which will bring some um, new construction into the downtown and, and uh, tax revenue for the urban renewal agency. The last piece of this is the impact on the overlapping taxing districts in terms of foregone revenue. So this is revenue that they would have collected. Uh, they still collect revenue based on the frozen base. And then this is anything that's incremental over that. Um, and it walks through what those are. Uh, the school district is a little unique in that um, it's funded through the state school fund. So this isn't a direct impact to them, but it's what we have to report it per the ORS in this regard. We will publish this in the paper as well, two times over the next, uh, up through March. Um, and then after that, we will have it available for any public um, review and comment. Thank you, Heather. Any uh, questions of Heather? Hearing none. Um, any discussion among ourselves? I will ask for a, a motion to approve resolution 2018-3. So moved. Second. And second. It has been moved by Council President Menke and seconded by um, Councilor uh, uh, Garvin. Um, so those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, please signify by saying nay. This resolution, resolution 2018-3, passes unanimously. We have resolution 2018-4, a resolution awarding the contract for construction of the Sadden Drive Sanitary Sewer Pipe Bursting <coughs> Project, Project 2017-12. We'll ask that Mike to present to us on this resolution. Thank you, Mayor, members of the council. I'll refer you to the brief staff report that's in your packet from project Mar manager, Larry Sherwood, as well as the proposed resolution and uh, project vicinity map that's presented. This project uh, represents the rehabilitation of about a thousand feet of sanita eight inch sanitary sewer main line that currently exists in the future Cottonwood Drive to Shadden Drive street corridor that will be constructed as part of uh, subdivision development that's occurring in that area. Uh, this will allow us to have that utility rehabbed and repaired before the street is paved. And as you know, um, uh, one of my pet peeves as your pavement manager is to make sure the utilities are in good shape before we put pavement down. So uh, funding for this project is contained in the budget for the wastewater services fund. We received two bids for the work. Uh, Canby Excavating was the low bidder in the amount of $68,919. The plan for the work will be that it will be completed by March of this calendar year. And then unless there are any questions, staff would recommend you adopt the resolution as presented. 
Any questions for Mike? Adam, is that one? No. Uh, I was just, is there any chance of like severe weather delays or would that have any effect on it? It just seems some of our other projects have faced weather issues. That's an interesting question. You know, obviously this is a leaking sewer pipe, so if there's a significant rain event, they probably won't be pipe bursting at the same time because sewer flows that they have to bypass would be an issue. But um, I, I don't, this is a, a normal uh, rehab process that can act, occur at all times of year, so I don't anticipate any problems with this being completed on time. Okay, thank you. We have Emory and Sons pretty busy in this in the community already, don't we? We do. This is actually Canby Excavating, who's right. done a number of sewer projects right. for us in the past, and I think is the uh, contractor for one of the subdivision developments that's occurring okay. in that area as well. Good. Yeah, I was just thinking they may have had a maybe a better bid given all the work they've been doing, and they know our our our, our community fairly well. So. Um, any other discussion? Hearing none, I will ask for a motion to approve resolution 2018-4. So moved. Second. It's been moved by uh, uh, Councillor Garvin and seconded by uh, Councillor Stassens. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, signify by saying nay. Resolution 2018-4 passes unanimously. That takes us to resolution 2018-5, a resolution awarding a contract amendment one for professional services for the water reclamation um, facility territorial um, treatment and uh, disinfectant project, project number 2017-2. Mike will call on you to make this presentation. Uh, once again, thank you, Mayor and members of the uh Council. Uh, again, I'll refer you to the brief staff report that's in your packet from engineering manager Rich Spofford, as well as the draft resolution, the proposed scope of work and fee uh, estimate, as well as a vicinity map for this project. Um, about a year ago in May of 2017, you awarded a design contract to CH2M Hill for the first phase of the next expansion project at the treatment plant, we'll, which we'll deal with our tertiary treatment process, as well as our disinfectant process. That's the end phase of our treatment. You may recall that we finished a secondary treatment expansion project in 2016, and this was the next large capital project in our wastewater facilities capital plan. The first scope of the work has been completed, and the second phase of work, which is before you this evening, will involve moving the project fo forward with design, including de development of the design contract documents and bid services for the project, which are expected to take place um, later this calendar year and into next fiscal year. Um, unless there are any questions, staff would recommend that you adopt the resolution as proposed, extending CH2M's contract for the f next phase of this work. Thank you. Any questions for Mike? Seeing none. Um, I ask for a motion to approve resolution number 2017-5. So moved. Second. It's been moved by Council President Mankey and seconded by uh, Councilor Rudin. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed signify by saying nay. Resolution number 2018-5 passes unanimously. Resolution 2018-6, a resolution of... Uh, approving an option and a tower lease agreement with Verizon Wireless LLC. Uh, Chief, uh, I'll turn it over to you to uh, make a presentation. Uh, Mr. Mayor and Councilors, uh, you have before you a contract with Verizon uh, to basically access uh, lease property and, uh, and access to our tower. Um, I don't want to go into my, I don't have all the pretty colored photos that Heather had with her uh, cell tower 
<laughs> presentation. Uh, but what we're actually doing is providing them uh, some ground space and access to the tower. Uh, currently, as our tower sits, we have uh, City of McMinnville, um, both um, <coughs> as well as some peripheral radio equipment, along with WICOM's emergency <coughs> communications equipment and microwave systems. Um, the, the survey has been done. There's room on this tower to accommodate this additional uh, facilities, uh, and it would eat one of the parking spaces on the parking lot side of the structure. Um, if you take a look at the pictures at the back, you'll see where the chain, the, the chain link fence, and that probably doesn't meet the modern aesthetic requirements of the code, uh, would be replaced uh, around the new area with a brick wall uh, by Verizon uh, to accommodate the uh, facilities and, and the infrastructure that they'll be placing within the, within the contract. Uh, the contract, um, the city attorney did, uh, in 2015 we were contacted um, and, and uh, the city attorney was responsible for negotiating the terms of the contract and did uh, an excellent job in um, managing and protecting our interests uh, as far as should it interfere with our emergency communication system and, and all of those things are identified within the contract. Uh, the contract terms are for $27,000 with a 2% increments annually over a 15 year period. Um, and, and there are um, exhibits within the contract to provide for a cancellation of the contract in the event that it, it interferes and cannot be repaired for the emergency communication systems. So if there are, are any questions, I'll be happy to entertain them. Any questions for Rich? Hearing none, I will ask for a motion to approve resolution 2018-6. So moved. Second. It's been moved by uh, Councilor Rudin and seconded by uh, Councilor Garvin. All in favor, uh, please uh, indicate by saying aye. 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 <clears throat> Any opposed by saying nay? <clears throat> Resolution number 2018-6 passes unanimously. Resolution 2018-7, resolution of the city of McMinnville um, amending a deed that was recorded August 18th, 1971 in film volume 85, page 1250, deed and mortgage records of Yamhill County. We'll turn it over to uh, Heather to make this presentation. Yes, so Mayor and City Councilors, this is something that we amended the City Council packet to bring to your attention tonight. It was brought to our attention on Friday afternoon. Um, but uh, the city conveyed a piece of property uh, back in 1971 to Evergreen Helicopters, Inc. It had a deed on it that had several restrictions associated with it in terms of how the property would be used. One of those restrictions is relative to the specific use of the property. It, um, it stated that um, the use of the property to the storing, servicing, operating, and repairing of helicopters and related equipment. So that was to serve exactly what Dell Smith wanted to use the property for at the time. It has since transacted and is now being used as the headquarters for TTR, which is a <coughs> software development com company in our community that's on a rapid growth trajectory and a great community partner. Um, they're moving forward with some financing to support their growth. And as they were going through that process, uh, that deed restriction became very troublesome for them because obviously tax software development is not the servicing and repair of helicopters. Um, so we're bringing to you a resolution tonight to amend that particular restriction in the deed to read that no aircraft, rotor and or fixed wing storing, repair, servicing, operating and repairing or flight instruction is allowed without a through the fence agreement approved by the city. So it removes the specific use constriction on the property, but then it also protects the city because this is adjacent to the airport and has a through the fence opportunity. And we want to make sure if it transacts again, that we have the opportunity to weigh in on that. Um, and if, if there's ever an interest in that interaction with the airport that they have to achieve that agreement. Any questions of Heather? Uh, just as a part of this, there are a number of properties that are not owned by helicopter companies over there. Would it be wise to kind of be looking at this and maybe doing some kind of further legislative type of actions to put this in place with all of the other uh, people that are using those properties? Yeah, so I, I don't know what the intent of the city is in regards to that type of 
deed scrub of those properties. This, this we spent 24 hours trying to turn this around, so this is pretty quick deep dive just into this particular. Well, I wasn't saying tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe tomorrow, you know. Thank <laughs> you. Any other questions for Heather? Again, Heather, I know you were really under the gun to, to research it, understand it, and, you know, when you have to go back to film, uh, <laughs> it, it's, it's quite, uh, it's quite uh, a radical thought to go back to film to look things up. But, uh, but again, thank you and your staff, and I'm sure uh, that our friends are going to be excited to be able to move forward with what they need to do. Uh, with that being said, uh, I will ask for a motion to approve uh, uh, resolution 2018-7. So moved. Second. 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 It has been moved by uh, Councillor Rudin and seconded by Council President Menke. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed by saying nay. K resolution number 2018-7 passes unanimously. <coughs> in front of us now is our consent agenda. These uh, are for the consideration of the minutes of our June 9th, 2018 dinner and regular council meetings. We also have a request from Les Burbas uh, LLC for a OLCC winery license located at 2803 Northeast uh, Orchard L uh, Avenue. Is there any counselor that would like to have any of these items removed from our um, consent agenda and put on the regular agenda. Hearing none, um, we will then um, ask for a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. So moved. And second. Second. It's been moved by Councillor Stassens and seconded by Councillor President Menke. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed by saying, uh, signifying by saying nay. This uh, consent agenda passes unanimously. Boy, we've gone through a lot tonight, you guys. <laughs> um, that brings us to advice information, uh, reports from counselors on committee and board assignments. I'll just uh, start with uh, Alan. Anything to report? No, we are going to have a meeting, a couple of meetings tomorrow. Affordable Housing Task Force and the uh, historic, historic landmarks. Historic, historic landmarks. Thank you, Heather. Okay. Tomorrow. Thank you, Wendy. Not at the same time. Not at the same time. <laughs> Not at this time. Okay. Uh, Adam. Not at this time. Sal, we welcome you uh, to our t proceedings tonight. It's good to have you on board, um, Council President. Uh, just a. Brief comment, uh, Visit McMinnville had their goal setting session a week or so ago, and it was a very interesting day. A lot of great ideas were generated. I think overall they're focusing for the future, at least for this year, on branding. There's an anticipation that there'll be a great deal more, rev significantly more revenue in the years to come, but the main focus appeared to be what what was doable is branding. Also, they will be coming back to us on the feasibility study that they came and requested of us as part of the overall idea of raising the, the uh, room tax. So look forward to that. Thank you, Kelly. Um, last Thursday, we had a, our, our Parkway committee meeting. And although uh, maybe the first part of the meeting was a bit of a celebration, we went right and focused in on uh, phase two and received an update. Uh, we had a legislative uh, report uh, from our, our um, from our state of Oregon lobbyist. And we also had um, uh, region two head uh, from ODOT that was there and just really had a great meeting. A lot of focus. Uh, we're, uh, we're moving forward and uh, um, sent or, uh, Representative Noble has put a, uh, a provision that he's bringing forth in the uh, short session that's going to allow us to take the monies that we receive, the 22, mil, uh, the 22 million, and not use it specifically for um, uh, right-of-way access, but put language in that would allow us to do uh, some of the um, 
the engineering piece, and it gives us much more flexibility, uh, so more to come from that perspective. Also, just would like to remind um, an, an, uh, everyone <coughs> in attendance that uh, next Tuesday evening, uh, not this late, 4.30, here in this building, we are going to have the inaugural Mayor's Award, and we're going to um, do a number of things that afternoon. It is from 4.30 to 6 o'clock. We are going to put uh, together an opportunity to update citizens, business owners, anyone that would like to come on where we've been and where we're going. Jeff and I will do that. We'll have an opportunity to network. We'll have an opportunity to recognize um, three entities or individuals in the, city, in the city that are going to receive what is called the Pillar Award for something that they have been involved in that has had some significance. And then we're going to uh, recognize an individual in with a legacy award which says uh, an individual that has spent a lifetime of putting a footprint on McMinnville. And then uh, we'll have the Twilighters from the high school, hors d'oeuvres, um, drinks, and so it's going to be a great opportunity to, to come and network and meet with department heads um, and set kind of set the story for where we're going in 2018. We look familiar, and it's open to everyone. A news register will have that, uh, an article in the newspaper on Friday. So we welcome everyone to do there, and especially we invite the counselors. Um, then on the next evening, which would be Wednesday the 31st, is the COG dinner. And that's going to be out at Spirit Mountain. And again, um, if you've not let um, um, Melissa know, uh, you need to do that ASAP. But again, it's to uh, w recognize leadership and membership of COG that will be coming together that evening. Uh, department heads, do you have any reports? I'll just run around fast. Uh, Chief? Susan, Rich, Scott, Heather, Mike, Melissa, David, and Jeff. That just doesn't seem fair. Yeah. So very, very <laughs> briefly, Heather and I uh, met with the core leadership team for the economic development strategy and the consultant team on the phone today as a project kickoff. Um, we brainstormed the um, a group of uh, stakeholders to serve on a broader leader leadership team started to work on identifying some folks um, that will be interviewed one-on-one -on -one about our economic strategies and will bring bringing you some information similar to what I provided to you at your work session last week about the larger strategic plan in the next week or so. That's all I have. Thank you. The building, the building report is a part of your packet. I'm going to go ahead and close our regular uh, council meeting. I'm going to open very quickly our urban renewal agency meeting and call this meeting to order. On our agenda tonight, we have a consent agenda uh, considering the minutes of our January 8, 2018 Urban Renewal Agency meeting. Is there any counselor that would like to remove that item into just the regular agenda? Hearing none, I would ask for a uh, motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. So moved. And a second? Second. Uh, it's been uh, moved by Councillor uh, President Menke and uh, seconded by Councillor Rudin. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed by nay. The consent agenda for the Urban Renewal Agency uh, has been approved unanimously. We have a resolution this evening, resolution 2018-2, a resolution appointing members to the McMinnville Urban Renewal um, Advisory Committee. Is that correct? Oh, but it is budget committee, okay. <laughs> because they become a part of the uh, <laughs> um, uh, uh, um, renewal budget committee. So I'll call on Marsha this time to update us. Well, as you know, the uh, Urban Renewal Agency Governing Board 
the Urban Renewal Agency uh, governing board is the same uh, as the um, people who are on the city council, the same positions and those uh, are in both uh, the council and the board. So um, kind of the uh, Urban Renewal Agency, however, as a body does need to pass a resolution to uh, appoint those two folks um, on the budget committee as well. Thank you, Marcia. The same discussion we had in our regularly scheduled meeting for the budget committee. Any discussion? Hearing none, I'll ask for a motion to approve resolution number 2018-2. So moved. Sec has been moved by Council President Makey and seconded by um, Councilor Rudin. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed by saying nay? Uh, Mr. Mayor, I just want to confirm that those are the the, the, the members that are being appointed through that resolution are John Mead and Sherry Markwood? Correct. Okay, thank you. Um, this resolution passes unanimously. Any other business to bring up in our urban renewal uh, agency meeting? Hearing none, I will close this meeting. Thank you for your attendance.